Now you're welcome along to the football show. Second half has just kicked off between Brighton and Southampton. It's one all. Aaron Connolly starting up front for Brighton this evening. World Cup draw very much taking our attention this evening. So here it is. Portugal ranked fifth in the world in our group. Serbia, who the Scots obviously beat on penalties in the Euros playoff not so long ago. 30th in the world are out of pot two. So it's Portugal, Serbia, Ireland, obviously, and then Luxembourg, 98th in the world these days, and Azerbaijan, 109th in the world these days. Uh, 13 teams will qualify in total from Europe, as opposed to the 24 odd that go to the European Championships. Obviously, as we know, much harder to qualify for a World Cup than a European Championships. So that will mean 10 group winners, and then the three best runners-up from those various groups. So the 10 group winners, and then three of the best runners-up is what make it through to the next stages. Obviously, there's playoffs for the runners-up, so it ain't easy. Stephen Kenny speaking to the media after the draw this evening gave his reaction to Group A. Uh, it's, it's an interesting draw for sure. You know, obviously Portugal been the European Championships and champions, and uh, it's, it's an interesting draw for sure. You know, obviously Portugal been the European Championships and. Champions and uh, Nations League holders. They've got great pedigree. Serbia, on, you know, on, on paper very strong. Had they haven't qualified for the Euros, and um, and Luxembourg, you know, checking their results. Obviously, a vastly improved team, um, who, who've did, done got ten points in the Nations League, and also Azerbaijan are a bit of an unknown quantity, and um, you know we'll have to uh, prepare accordingly. You know, so it's it's an interesting game in a five game. Um, group or five team group rather than six as well, which is, which is has some 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 points. Yeah, I mean it was positive points that you've just got two games. You might get a bit more time with the players on the training pitch rather than this relentless match after match. Yeah, I think the concept of three games in a window is obviously new concept. Uh, you know that was because of initially with the Nations League with the with the with the playoff, and then and then the Nations League. But I think uh, the players. Uh, traditionally, have been used to two games in a window, and um, you know, so the three. Obviously, it doesn't look like there possibly will be friendlies on the on some of the dates, but it doesn't look like you know. Obviously, we won't have three competitive games in in the window, which is which lessens the physical pressure on on players. For example, you know, that's a, that's a help. What's the expectation with the group there? Uh, well, we'll, we'll approach the games really positively, you know, particularly in March, and uh, and try and have a good month, you know, you know, have a good window in March, and I think uh, we can't rule anything. Yet. We have to, you know, we haven't qualified for the World Cup in 2002, it's 20 years, and there has to be our ambition to try and qualify. That's why we're here. That's why we're here to try and qualify for the World Cup, and it's difficult as you know, 13 teams in Europe, of course, but we we we're here to try and qualify to compete. And, uh, you know, that is certainly an intention to try and try and achieve that. Stephen Kenny there, Nathan Murphy asking the questions. David Snage attended the press conference. That sounded like Nathan was at it, David. Were you at the press conference? I was, yeah. Um, obviously, we were in dif different sections just because of obviously COVID now and all the rest. So it was like, what, broadcast, daily newspapers and then Sunday newspapers. So, okay. um, yeah, it was out there and uh, yeah, it was in, in good form. Good. The dreaded Zoom press conferences might be behind us for a while at least. So Portugal, mm -hmm. Serbia, Luxembourg, Azerbaijan. It's a five-team group. We could have been in a six-team group, as Stephen Kenny outlined yeah. there. So maybe uh, fewer games ain't such a bad thing, given the compressed nature of football at the moment. Thoughts? Yeah, well, it, it, obviously there's still going to be a tr there's still a window there for three games in March. And the nature of the fixtures are going to be coming out tomorrow. So there does seem to be a suggestion that there will be a friendly game. But it's whether or not who do you, who do you get to play it and where where that friendly will fit in the schedule. So there could be still a situation whereby Ireland have um, one of the one of the qualifiers, then a friendly window, and then another qualifier, or it could be the friendly could be at the start of that of that window, and then you have the two games. So that's still to be still to be decided. I think um, that will come out come out tomorrow. So I think I think there will be a game. And I don't know necessarily if it'll be just maybe that they won't have that game. It'll more than likely will be, and rather than have an extra time for for training necessarily. No, true. The point is he can rest some players, though. I suppose it'll be a less demanding yeah, yeah. schedule, which is good. So thoughts on Serbia, thoughts on Portugal, Serbia in particular. I mean, we know all about Portugal. They're fifth in the yeah. world. I mean, 
Ronaldo's hanging around, more than hanging around. Uh, João Felix, Diogo Jota, João Moutinho, Bruno Fernandes, Bernardo Silva, Ruben Neves. We're obviously up against it there. What about Serbia? They're a more inconsistent bunch of late. Yeah, but if you, and that was my first instinct. You're looking at it, you're thinking, right, Portugal, like, you, you, you reeled off those players there. Like you would imagine, they will they will top the group. Like they didn't top their their group in in Europe qualifying. They finished behind behind Ukraine, and but they finished obviously just a few points ahead of Serbia. Like Serbia, Serbia, we we've, we've played them. Like it's it's not going only recently, like a few years ago. Mm. Remember after that, after coming up, coming up after Euro twenty sixteen. If I remember, that was the first game back after Euro twenty sixteen when Ireland were kind of full of confidence. And start started well out, out there in Belgrade and just slowly slowly unraveled and then obviously you nicked it again and, and got a draw but like they can score goals you know they, they've got goals in their team like they scored like they scored like seventeen goals or they scored seventeen goals in like in the Euro Euro qualifying group you know like they they have players like Dusan Tadic who who's obviously with Ajax now Premier League credibility but is playing at the elite level in Champions League and if you're looking at this now if you with Ireland because of what's happened like, over the last year and just the, the, the lack of goals, like one goal, it, it just, like, there is a real dare of confidence there now. Like you can't, obviously listen, it's a World Cup qualifying group so there's obviously that little maybe a wave of a wave of optimism but there's a long time between now and, and March and so much, so much could happen and fingers crossed by the time it, by the time it comes around, a lot of what's gone on in the last year it is maybe put to bed, especially obviously some of the stuff around so the, the video nonsense really. Um, but the time March comes around, we're at a point where Ireland are going into it with hopefully players in form, not not injured. Like oh, f- fingers crossed and please God, COVID isn't gonna be such gonna have such an impact on on preparation and and, and what can happen. So Obviously, you get that little initial wave of, of euphoria because it's a World Cup, there's World Cup qualifiers and on the, on the face, and you're thinking, yeah, you know what? We have to start well. And that's going to that's gonna be the big thing here. It's not like the old days, maybe, where you could, Kenny would sit around, the, t- the manager would sit around the table, which he actually did with the with the under-21s and try and plot the fixtures and say, well, it's a lot of it will be looking to draw on, on, on how things go and, and how um, how the fixtures will, will, will come tomorrow because, because of what's happened, there is a little... There is a little bit of negativity around the place at the moment in terms of like with well, fans haven't been in stadiums, but just because of the results. So you just need to start well in March. You need to have that little bit of luck that maybe you get a kind of a Luxembourg at home, or you get a kind of a double header at home against maybe like Azer- Azerbaijan or even a Serbia early doors, and maybe be able to catch them cold and just mm. and nick some sort of result. And it's so difficult to make a World Cup from Europe. Three of the runners up teams, the best placed runner-up teams. So, I mean, it's not just enough for us to eke out some results. We probably need to score some goals and get a decent points total. And I'm not sure how they yeah. can pair uh, runners-up from five uh, and, five team groups and 16 groups. But anyway, look, the, the general point for now is you have to be not just a runner-up, but a good runner-up, and then you'll join two Nations League group winners. So it's not easy. Serbia are kind of a weird case in that they haven't reached a Euro since 2000, but they've done pretty well on the World Cup front. Like, they were there in 18... They were there in 2010, they were there in 06. I'm not quite yeah. sure how they managed that and then don't make the Euros, but uh, that's where we are. On uh, the uh, video situation, as you rolled your yeah. eyes, you rolled your eyes beautifully there <laughs> when you mentioned it. So I, it feels like a long time ago now when it all was brewing up. And yeah. uh, naturally, it, this was the first time Stephen Kenny had spoken to the media uh, since it had all blown up. So he was asked about it. Here's Nathan asking the question, have a listen. It was a strange fallout after the last three matches, but everything that happened around the video and you having to go and meet with the CEO to explain what happened. Can you talk through it from your point of view, from deciding what was going to go into the video? Are you still satisfied it was the right thing to do? And also, are you surprised with everything that happened since then? To be honest with you, the video was a non-story. You know, there's, you know, I, th- you know, I think it's, uh, you know, it was a football video, basically with goals scored by the players in training and goals scored in Wembley the night before and essentially that was the major part of it with, with also with some goals from from previous Ireland matches against England and, and you know some historical references and I think that's uh, that was it and you know certainly it um, you know a lot was a lot was made of it but it, you know it's 
very light on content in that regard. You must have been pretty surprised though then, if that was the case, to see it on the back page of the Daily Mail and a statement coming out saying it was being investigated urgently by the FAI. Yeah, no, it was, it was a big surprise and I think, um, you know, so that's that, that's something that came. It was a surprise, to be honest. Kevin, did you feel undermined by that thing? No, no, I didn't at all. I think, uh, you know, it's uh, <laughs> we'll take it on our stride and we'll move on. You know, I think uh, we're not we're not we're not uh, we're not going to dwell on the situation. You know, it's something that happened, and we, you know, I think, you know, we're, di we're disappointed, um, but we certainly move on. The fact that there's details coming out from the sanctuary, the dressing room, is that a big worry for you? No, it's not a concern for me. You know, I, I think the way, the, 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 you know, I don't think the leaks were, you know, intentionally, definitely not intentionally from the dressing room. And I think uh, there may be people behind the scenes uh, or elsewhere who want to sort of um, cause problems for the team or, you know, who, who maybe don't have the best interests of the team, you know, I think. But certainly, uh, no, I've no problem with any of the any, any of the anyone in the dressing room. That was that's not an issue for me. And those people behind the scenes who may want to cause issues, do you know who they are? Well, listen, you know, I've said enough on that, and that that's all I'm willing to say. And there was a, there was a clear suggestion through it, and I know he answered it in a in a social media posting himself. There was a clear suggestion in it that, that in a lot of the reports. Alan Kelly had made a complaint or expressed concerns or something like that. Is that the case? No, he, he definitely did not make a complaint. And I think that's, you know, I'm not discussing any member of staff in the press conference, but I definitely, you know, I think, you know, that's that's the only disservice to Alan, to be fair. Sorry, it's reasonable to ask. No, not, not from yourself, but the, not, 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 not from yourself, but just the, the, the sentiment of the whole, there was a, a lot spoken about that, but that, that wasn't fair, probably on him, to be, to be honest. Okay, and were you satisfied with the way that the FAA handled it there? They had an investigation, they sat down and talked to you, spoke to a lot of people. Did you feel that was necessary? <laughs> Listen, it was a distraction, and, uh, you know, we put it behind us, you know, and I think really we're fairly focused on the World Cup qualifiers now, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. It, it was a distraction, and we could, we could, you know, we all could have done without it, but I think, um, you know, I think, we're very firmly focused on, on the football now and some great games in the World Cup qualifiers and that's, that's what we're looking forward to. Stephen Kenny there speaking this evening to the media. The reason it blew up, David, was twofold, I would say, largely. The things which really gave it a sense of a substance um, was that the FAI talked about an urgent investigation and launched an urgent investigation. So that, that took it from newspaper story to seemingly very serious, as we looked yeah. on from the outside. And secondly, the Alan Kelly situation, the reports for a number of days before he came out and uh, discussed the thing that, uh, one, he may have leaked it, which he denied, and then there was also the suggestion that he complained, which Stephen Kenny has denied there. So that was the re they were the two main reasons this thing blew up. When he, t when he talks there about the FAI role in all this, initially you're not too sure if he says his surprise was at the fact that it appeared in the mail or that the FAI launched an investigation. But certainly when he later describes it as a distraction, he clearly wasn't best pleased that the FAI announced an official investigation into him. Well, no, he wasn't. And what turned it into a story was that reaction from the FAI and saying about this urgent investigation and that's obviously then the reason why journalists, myself included, people would have been is then making calls, getting in touch with contacts and finding out, well, hold on, like, what's going on here? Like, what, what, what's happened? And that's what made this a bit more curious was because the more people you spoke to and people who you, who you can trust and be honest about and be upfront were saying, this is, there's nothing in this really, like, you know? And then, but not only that, we were talking there about Stephen Kenny, yeah, like, when it was on the he would have been—he was very disappointed of of the manner of how things have played out. But I think what became clear to the FAI when these this investigation, which eventually was a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews with some of his staff personally, and then some Zoom calls, was the way of reaction from people and just how much he was backed by his own staff and also players. Like, as it we're coming, we're we're not even we're a year pretty much into his his reign as manager. And you get this thing maybe trying to get fans with fans with typewriters and all the rest of it, but you're still you still have to give the fella give the fella a chance. Results ha results haven't been results haven't been good, but the manner in just how some stuff came out and talking about 
dis dissatisfaction, which from my point of view of speaking with, to people in that dressing room and getting the source from multiple people was just blatantly not the case. Like there's people in that dressing room who've been there for eight, nine years and are literally have bought into what Stephen Kenny is doing. And are not only that, but have literally sp spoken about you seeing what he wants to do and actual enjoyment of training and enjoyment of coming in. And that hasn't been there for a while. Now, that means nothing if you're not getting results. This is what has to, has to come next, mm. you know? But it was one of those aspects over the last couple of weeks of just basic, of, of, of speaking to people within, within that dressing room, within that camp around, around the squads. And it just seemed... I think the fact that I was in the, the back page of the, of the mail in England and it was the mail who were who had obviously broke this story and then that that reaction that's what that's what gave it legs but I think some of the stuff that further came out talking about senior players in the squad are already having having doubts about the manager obviously that was reported by some people who were getting that information and then yet in the strongest possible terms, some of his staff are going into bat for him, and some of his senior players are going into bat for him in the strongest possible terms. Mm -hmm. And coming out, coming out of it where, as it was put to me, Gary Holmes would have, would have had his ears ringing from what from what was said to him, not from what Stephen Kenny had to say, but from those around him. And that's, in my mind, what kind of gave me a bit of confidence in the sense of just the lack of. I don't know, kind of, I don't know, the lack of, not that it wasn't news, but it was because it obviously it broke and you, have, and you have to follow it up. But I don't think this is something that is going to be laboured in, in the camp. And if that, it could actually be to maybe the, the benefit in terms of using it as a tool to bring even people closer together. Mm. He said something there which he clearly didn't want to elaborate on. And, you know, as with every manager speaking publicly, they will uh, take what they're really thinking and dilute it by about 90% if possible. So he said the league's definitely not intentionally from the dressing room. I think there may be people behind the scenes or elsewhere who want to cause problems for the team. Now, would yeah. you interpret behind the scenes as behind the scenes at the FAI or is he talking about agents and, and further behind the scenes? Well, see, this is it. I was actually... To be honest, I was a little bit surprised that he even came out and and said that on the on the record in terms of talking about people behind the scenes, maybe wanting to cause a little bit of dissatisfaction. Like in terms of if it's inadvertently, like players talk to agents, players would say to an agent, "Oh, like, you never guess what this happened," or blah blah blah, and then all of a sudden that can that can end up with it. You know, yeah. I've benefited from, I've benefited from myself, so like you're not gonna like, I'm not gonna complain complain about that. Like if he's, I, I can't say if he was pointing at someone in the room and pointing at someone there saying, "Well, someone's been is trying to undermine him within the FAO." I, mm. I don't know that if 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 that is the case, but the fact that he's already there, spoken about having no problem with Alan Kelly's, like he said there, Alan Kelly's going to be coming back in March. If that's going to be an issue, that maybe would have to be have to be rectified. Listen, you can't. I don't think you can. You can't just gloss over it. It's an issue that's there, and it's something that. It's, I think it's something that will be forgotten very quickly in March when the, when the World Cup games come around and if Ireland get off to a good start. If they don't, uh, there's a bit of a struggle and maybe there's another couple of defeats or nil all draws and just things aren't progressing. Well, then it's just going to be something now that's going to be that's going to be referenced. It could be in a year's time something that's referenced as a blip at the very beginning or the start of something that unravels and. You would hope, because everyone, you, you want to see the Ireland team do well. You want to see the Ireland team progress. Yeah. But the, what they have to do now is go out and actually and actually do it. Like he's he's had his, he's like he put it was over ten, ten players or so over the last while in terms of th those games. He's he, he, it's almost as if up his hands because by the time March comes around, you don't know who's going to be available. Sure. You know, like it's it's going to be that. But if it's people behind the scenes in the FAI, then he needs to root them out and keep them away from. Yeah, well, that's that's the yeah that's well that's the problem, and I would imagine stuff like that has been going, has been has been happening. You would you would suspect that if if there are suggestions that somebody within who's close to that who's close to that squad of players and is around is is doing this, that they won't be around. Mm -hmm. That's and it, it would be very simple to kind of deduct that. But if if not, and it's a simple case of maybe. It could have been, could have been, as I said, inadvertently loose lips to an agent, and then that's how it, that's how it got out. Well, then I don't, I think that's just part and parcel of football. You know, players, players yeah. talk to their agents. You see, Paul, you, know, you see the example today, me and Oriola and Paul Pogba. Like, you know what I mean? Like, 
agents do now have so much power and it yeah. could have just been it could have honestly it could have just been as simple as that where Luke's lips with a player talking about something especially you see Alan Kelly come out and and, and deny it and that's someone who's been involved in Irish football for so long so yeah. and it, be, Kelly didn't deny making a complaint he certainly denied being the leak but Stephen Kenny has now confirmed this evening he absolutely didn't make the complaint yeah do we know who made the complaint do we know? I know. I know. In the FAI, they probably know, but do we know? Yeah. Well, no, it hasn't been. Right. It hasn't been put forward. Like, if you, you just, when you're speaking to people, and this is this is where it is a little bit pure because when you're speaking to people and you're getting briefed on and off the on and off the record, it was very easy to read between the to read between the lines. But it's clear that that wasn't the case, you know. Yeah. Which is another issue. That's another issue, isn't it? Which is part of this. Whereas, well, who who was it? And, mm. Like, what's so, their motivation? Yeah. Yeah, and in terms of off the record briefings, which clearly you can't divulge here, and I appreciate that, but I'm just curious as well. Uh, there must be lots of uh, speculation about who's responsible for the leak. There's the complaint, and then there's the leak, like yeah. how it ends up in the mail. Are you hearing lots of different things there? Or are you hearing it consistently being pointed towards one potential person? No, with the leak. The, the, the main thing of and the main thing I can deduct, and this is just, and this is only going off my own, my own groundwork, is that. It's not some sort of like divided camp or camp whereby people, as, as had been portrayed, where already the knives were out for, for Stephen Kenny with, with, with the squad. Mm -hmm. Like, it's no point in me, like, it's no point in me saying that if, if, if it's not the, the, the information that I've been given, and I wouldn't be saying it if it wasn't from the fact that I was getting it from, from multiple sources. And not just one point, one point of view. Otherwise, I just, I just looked like an idiot if I was going to say and everything was great, and it clearly, it clearly wasn't. Yeah. But don't get me wrong; you're going to have the same issues. Like, like we've seen the thing with with James McLean coming out and 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 obviously on Instagram and, and saying stuff. But like, he, he's clearly not 100 percent happy that he hasn't always played. But that's just one of the middle stuff that happens happens within the squad. I think it's the fact that mm. what has what has as it was put to me from someone from a senior player like already talking about being named as someone who's almost out to get the manager and wondering well what's like what's the evidence for that like and right. now listen that's it but the thing is if people are reporting that they're obviously getting certain information certain information too which it's to a degree is maybe a, a, a bit of chinese whispers but it just strikes me as a bit it strikes me as a uh, it just strikes me it's a bit strange that so so soon into it, right? Like, didn't hasn't got off hasn't got off great that there's certain bits getting leaked out from from one side, and yeah, you speak to people who have actually been named in this, and they're yeah. saying it's not true. So I don't know. Like, look what look what happened with, even with Andy Stevens coming out and talking about the fact that it wasn't something that was even spoken about this video mm. or um, among, among the players, and yeah, apparently it's something that is really kind of has like caused shockwaves yeah. uh, among the squad. Like I don't want to be coming out here. This isn't me coming out on behalf of everything's great in the FAO, clearly when, you have, when you've scored one goal and not won a game for the game, so obviously things have to improve, but I think to be coming out and maybe saying that the Oil manager is already being dealt, being severely dealt by senior players mm. is just, I don't know, a bit it's, peculiar. It's, it's not what you're hearing. One of the reasons we had no. you on is I know you have good contacts in the dressing room, so you could give us a sense of what you're hearing. I mean... You're not saying I'm talking to every single player in the camp, but you're getting a good sense of things. I mean, yeah. I, it was it. There is something weird about the whole thing, you know. There just is. Like, fair enough if, uh, you know, uh, the historical references in that video are not your thing, and you're like 21st century baby, and you're kind of rolling your eyes at this, saying, yeah, "Not for me." Uh, I, that, that's fine. Not everything a manager does is going to uh, prompt a reaction in every single player, that's just human nature. But uh, the sense that there were players offended, that, oh, that I mean, that seems stretching it right from the off, you know what I mean? That really, oh, no. really, even like Alan Kelly, who's been part of how many buses with rebel songs on the way to matches, they just, I know, there, I know. There, there was, there is, and remains something off about it. And again, Kenny's line this evening, and it is open to interpretation to a degree, he said that, um, Pump, pump, pump. Where is it? Uh, yes, I think there may be people behind the scenes or elsewhere who want to cause problems for the team and don't have the mm. interests, uh, the best interests of the team. But again, I don't know if he's talking behind the scenes at the FAI or just behind the scenes in football, behind, you know, whatever architecture is there behind the footballers. So that's where we are. Um,
the FAI Cup final briefly. I know you were at it. It's worth uh, mentioning mm. for a moment. Fifth time in six years, it goes to extra time. I mean, at this stage, you, now, you now know to tell the family, I'll be home. Uh, <laughs> I'll well, be uh, home I've late. Actually, I've, I've, literally, I've literally just thawed out as well. <laughs> absolutely Baltic. It's by far the coldest I've ever been at any football match. And I, was in, I was in St. Petersburg a few years ago with Dundalk in the, in the Europa League and they actually had heaters for us in the press box there, so at least that was something. But um, it was freezing. But in fairness, a good game. It didn't start off that great and then gradually... Uh, gradually picked up and just done dark, yeah. He just, just about nicked it and just about mm. deserved it in the end, really. Maybe for large chunks of it, Rovers might have been the better team, but for, for Dundalk, it puts a, yeah. a completely different complexion on their season, you know. Where does all this leave uh, Gia Vignoli, by the way? I'd say he's very, very happy. He was dropping in bottles of wine to staff around Oriel Park today, by all accounts. Okay. Um, it's nothing, like obviously, he still has the Arsenal game on uh, coming on Thursday. Mm. Um, it's a strange one because. But there was a time where it looked as if he was definitely going to be getting the job offered as a contract. That that kind of stuff has has killed a little bit. I know obviously he has his family and stuff, so if he is to get the job on a full time basis, there's going to be a situation regarding that. Um, again, my information on it is that no decision seems to have been made definitively on it. Obviously, and then see what's going to play out. But you got the big issue where you've got the majority of that squad out of contract. Like mm. I think there's only about four or five. Four or five players, and see Chris Shields, who was exceptional yesterday. Yeah, he's, he's, had, in the he's, contract. Had, he's had a very good couple of weeks. Yeah. Oh, you, well, this is like, remember that video? I don't know, remember that clip. Remember of, um, it was actually during the last Europa League one in 2016 when I think it was after the Patti Borisov game, and uh, Martin O'Neill actually went into the dressing room after and just sort of said, actually, if you, if you only saw it out your passing, you could probably get into the team, the Ireland team, you know, and that's actually something that he has worked on and he has improved. Like, I, I did a piece on him for the Irish examiner just because. It was one of those games where, as it went on, he just covered so much ground and it's just his awareness and his anticipation of, of yeah. certain things. And that little battle with, with, with Jack Bourne, like he's under contract, which is a big thing for them. But that's the future of the manager is, is, is going to be important because the nature of the League of Ireland, the like, season's over for them really on tours. There'll be lads walking out before Christmas going to, going to rivals, you know, unless things get started out sharpish. And that's just the nature of how it is, you know? Okay. Um, so it's all up in the air there, including Giovanni, and I guess we'll hear when we hear. But Jim Jilton's coming in, isn't he? He's having a role in the next next season. I think, well, there's some there was some talk. I, again, I haven't had it confirmed. No, but there's, yeah. there's some talk of coming in as the director of football. Yeah, it's, it's at a technical some, level. It's not. It's obviously not manager, but it's at some kind of technical level. Yeah. Yeah, he's like he's involved. Obviously, with, with, with Northern Ireland, he's kind of like, been heavily in there in terms of on the, on the technical side too. This is someone with extremely, extremely. Like impressive pedigree in terms of as, as a player in the Premier League and obviously as an international with as an international with Northern Ireland. But then it's just another aspect we don't know. Like, it, like since the last year or so, at the very remember I remember speaking just speaking to you about this before with Peak Six. It was a time when it looked as if they had everything in place to actually go on and be stable and actually mm. build on when after when Stephen Kenny left. And it, it just hasn't it doesn't really look like that now. So if obviously if they're putting the building box in place or someone like Jimmy Gilton coming in and Wherever the manager is going to be underneath them, then that could be impressive because Luke Lashon McGrover is like they're going to, well, again, depending on what happens with, with Jack Bourne and, and, and what happens there, like it looks like, like I'd be very surprised if he's still in the League of Ireland next year. But mm. like Rovers, again, Rovers have a good structure there. They've got a solid, a solid kind of core of, of a, like a squad. That was one, again, because that was one of the things with, with, with Dundalk that kind of over the last seven, eight years has. They don't be able to just kind of stay on top is the fact that they had such a core of players to continually work to getting on mm. with two year contracts, 52 week contracts, stuff like this. Like lads getting three year contracts, whereas now they're at a point where some lads still don't know who the manager is going to be yeah. for certain and don't know if they're going to be there. And as was shown yesterday, there's still a fair bit of life left in this Dundalk team. David Snaith, brilliant stuff. Thanks so much, David. Cheers. No worries, take care. Cheers. 74 minutes on the clock. Brighton won, Southampton won. Aaron Connolly came off on 64 minutes, so he got the guts of an hour under his belt. A short ad break will bring you Brian Kerr's thoughts on Spurs Arsenal. He was covering the game for us yesterday with Nathan. That's on the way. We have to be really positive in the game and to, and to start on the front foot rather than the back foot. And I think everything else will fall into place if we can do that. 
And we need to see that against Italy. Courage. We need players of courage and balls. We're talking to the fans today. They did say they will all be devastated if they are forced to go home today. They have 90 minutes for Ireland to somehow try and change it. Jeff Hendry trying to be a very physical presence at the edge box. Takes a shot left oh, footed and it flashes just wide. The first real chance of the game. And O'Neill will be very, very pleased with the opening 15 minutes. Murphy and Long proving a real handful for the three man Italian defence. Yeah, you just missed the boos from the Irish fans. There were a lot of whistles there. Shane Long is actually still remonstrating with the referee at the moment because he feels he's been very badly treated in that first half. A stonewall penalty right at the end of the half. James McLean cutting into the penalty area and then Bernadaschi coming back, trying to cover and just ran straight into James McLean, took him down. It's a clear penalty. The referee is five yards away. the ball with paddy power new normal same old football paddy power gamble responsibly gamblingcare.ie christmas has come early on news talk with the 12 iphones of christmas we have an iphone 12 pro up for grabs every single day for 12 days across the station simply answer the christmas question and a brand new iphone 12 pro could be yours Plus, there are more chances to win by downloading the News Talk app and on News Talk's Instagram. 12 days, 12 iPhones, 12 chances to win on News Talk. Certainty. With Volkswagen commercial vehicles, it's included as standard. The Crafter, Transporter and the all-new fifth-generation Caddy are more innovative, dynamic and efficient than ever before. Now, with HP Finance from 0%, Purchase contributions of up to €3,500 and service plans from €9.99. They're the smart next step for your business. For vans and offers you can rely on always, contact your local Volkswagen commercial vehicles dealer or visit volkswagenvans.ie and leave the rest to us. Finance provided by way of higher purchase agreement from Volkswagen Financial Services Ireland and subject to lending criteria. Terms and conditions apply. Sky Cinema has my favourite movies. 12 Little Creatures, 11 Sonic Booms, 10 Kisses Last Christmas, 9 Dancing Cats, 8 Harry Potter, 7 Play Joe Monday, 6 Tribes of Trolls, 5 Frozen Friends, <clears throat> 4 Little Women, 3 in Secret Garden, 2 Bad Boys, and an Elf in the Big City. You, a feast of movies to make your Christmas on Sky Cinema. Looking for professional tools and safety supplies? Then you need CaulfieldIndustrial.com one of Ireland's largest Irish-owned suppliers with over 50,000 items in stock. CaulfieldIndustrial.com offers quality tools, safety gear and equipment from all the top brands like DeWalt, Snickers, Bosch, Stanley, Baco and more. So whether you're a professional tradesman or a DIY enthusiast, shop online at CaulfieldIndustrial.com. Now is the time to make a plan to keep well over the months ahead. Being creative can really help you to relax. Try to keep up a hobby or start a new one. 
or even just switch off. Make your plan today to keep well. Find more ideas at gov.ie forward slash healthy Ireland. 100% new, still 100% caddy. The fifth generation all new caddy cargo is more innovative, dynamic and efficient than ever before. With 1500 euro purchase contribution plus a caddy cargo service plan for 9 euro 99. Contact your local Volkswagen commercial vehicles dealer or visit volkswagenvans.ie to reserve yours now. T's and C's apply. Football on off the ball. With Paddy Power. Minimal contact in stadiums. Shouldn't stop the usual suspects from going down. Gamble responsibly. Gamblingcare.ie Ten minutes to go. Brighton 1, Southampton 2. Danny Ings has just scored a penalty for Southampton with nine minutes to go and you will see some grumblings about VAR intervening after this match. Brighton not happy. Foul outside the area just, but VAR reckoned it was just inside. Penalty given. They're not happy. Jose Mourinho's happy. He's got this Spurs team right where he wants them. They are organised, they are hungry when they need to be. They are cynical and doing what he wants them to do. Finally, not being the nice you-know-whats that he felt they were last season. And they have beaten Arsenal 2-0. Kane, Son, two brilliant goals. And uh, showed up shop in the second half. And they're top of the table. Joined top with Liverpool after Liverpool's 4-0 win. We had the Spurs-Arsenal game live here and off the ball. Premier League commentary coming at you every Sunday. It was Nathan... Brian Kerr and they had a little chat afterwards. So Spurs top Premier League, Brian, after a somewhat bizarre North London derby, 2-0 to Tottenham, Arsenal absolutely dominated possession, yet still as comfortable a win as I can remember Spurs having in a North London derby. For sure, it's uh, normally a game, Nathan, with, with plenty of goals and um, in the past Spurs have often floundered from a lead position, but today uh, in the system that they're playing, and the confidence they're playing with, and the individual performances, it did come out to be a comfortable win. Two magnificent goals in the first half on the counter-attack, typical of Spurs' uh, performances now under uh, Jose Marino, and uh, not unlike the game with, with Manchester City, where they did the th same thing and kind of suffocated Manchester City the second half. Today, they allowed Arsenal to have the ball. And as you, as you suggested, Arsenal never really looked like they were going to pull it out. Although, had they had the breakthrough, or at least had a couple of saves to make, a couple of decent headed say, or from headers from Lacazette. But other than that, it was just Arsenal with the ball, putting it into the penalty area, and Spurs clearing it with, with um, reasonable composure and confidence, you'd have to say. But certainly great organisation, discipline and uh, understanding of how they were going to go about their business. We could spend all day as a normal talking in superlatives about Harry Kane and Hyung Min Son, but the goals were only half the story. It was the defensive side of it, and Alderweireld and Dyer and Hoiberg, and not even just them. It looks as though Mourinho has a group of players there now who really do believe and trust in what he's telling them to do, because it, like they didn't offer anything in the second half. It was a very unselfish performance, it felt, from a side who were 2-0 up in a North London derby who I'm sure would love to have gone out and scored more goals. Yes, um, that looks like the way it is. I mean, the players are brought into it because it's been successful. They're winning games. They're probably getting substantial bonuses for winning games. They lost the first match of the season. Um, other than that, they, they, they've not lost the lost game. What lost the game in Europa League? But they're stringing the wins together and against the better teams. I think, you know, for for years, Spurs have struggled against the uh, traditional top six away away from home, particularly. But even at times at, at home too. And um, they, they, as you, you said, the word unselfish. I think that's fair to say. You look at the discipline of Sissoko and Heiberg playing deep, often back between the centre halves and their own full backs. Today, mostly just out in front of them, but rarely in the other half of the pitch. Lo Celso, too, has become a very disciplined player when he gets a chance. That's only his second start. He's generally coming on as sub, played instead of Endembele today. I thought he put in a great performance, a pair pass on the second goal when uh, on the, when the counter-attack situation when Spurs won the ball back at the edge of their own box. But, yeah, no, nothing in the second half in terms of... Um, controlled possession, maybe one little spell at one stage, but in general I would say they had very few passes in the opposition's half, but they seem quite content with that. The players have bought into it. 
The crowd that were there today were happy enough with it. They didn't see much action, and at the end, they were out behind the, 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 the far goal, let's say, from where Spurs scored. But they would be just delighted with the position that the team are in and that they're at the top of the table and that they beat Arsenal in, in the North London derby. It'd be interesting how the crowd would react to them playing like that consistently, um, le- allowing the opposition to have the ball in, in their own stadium. I, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I, I think sports supporters would like to see a bit more of them as a, as a team controlling the game and the opposition's half and having some shots on goal. I can only remember three attempts on the goal today of which we scored two. But look, it's, it's, been, it's, it, it's working for them at the moment, so there'll be very little complaints. Go on then, talk in the superlatives about Harry Kane and Young Min Son. Son onto 10 goals for the season, Kane onto 8. Once again, they were the providers for each other's goals. And listen, we all know how good Harry Kane is. Young Min Son was probably one of the more underappreciated players in the Premier League in previous seasons, did the job, but Harry Kane took all the plaudits. The level Son is at, are you surprised in any way he's been able to get to that higher level that we've seen from him, 10 goals in 11 games? I think he's an extraordinary fella in his his walk rate for Spurs over the years was never underestimated. He's been a, a, a great player for them. Uh, he's, he's, he's technically very, very good on either side of the pitch, right or left. I think he's better on the left in the position we saw him today, coming in on his right foot. But he has scored all sorts of different goals for Spurs. You mentioned the commentary, his best season was a few seasons ago. He got 14 in one season. He's been hovering around the, the 10 mark in the last couple of seasons. Uh, this season, he, he's already on 10. So I think this is going to be his best season if he stays fit. Had a few little problems last year. Remember, he, he got sent off a couple of times last season, and then, you know, and, and he's not a player who gets involved in tackles um, in a nasty way. But he's a brilliant foil for Kane and, and for anyone in the team. Um, his walk rate is just extraordinary. You think about him going off and doing his time in the army in Korea last year, come back, and then just seem to take uh, uh, take on take it on again from where he let it off before he went. So he, he's just an all-time, an all-round great guy. He generally plays with a smile on his face. Um, he has a massive fan club. Uh, you know, we've been over there and seen the number of uh, Korean fans outside the stadium before the match. The adoration that is there for him, for from, I'd say Koreans and maybe people all around the world, but particularly in Asia, I'd say he's such a, a, a big star. But he deserves to have got the, that status. He plays the game with a smile on his face, plays with great diligence, works hard for his team, uh, enjoys when some other players achieve things and score goals and matches. But he, 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 I mean, I think he is world class at the moment himself and Harry Kane as regards, you know, if you're looking at the top 10, 15 strikers in the world, you'd have to include both of them in that status. They are now top of the league. We're 11 games in. They've got Kane and Son. It goes without saying, I guess, they're contenders. If you're looking at Tottenham sustaining this and actually getting right to the very end, which they've done not that long ago when Rizzo Pochettino was there, is there any weak link? Is there any part of that team? Is there any obvious place where actually they're going to fall down over the coming months? Well, if they if they have more possession, if they if they are to play against opposition, say the teams from the lower part of the league, you look already they beat West Brom, who fortunate enough one 0 victory, one 0 victory over over Burnley as well, with Bale come on get a headed goal, and you know you look at the match back as far as the Newcastle game, the one all draw, where the opposition allows Spurs to do what Spurs have done to Manchester City, Chelsea, and now today Arsenal, where they concede opposition, uh, concede ground and concede possession. Then have they got the creativity uh, and the pace to make goals and score goals and to be solid against opposition who have a lot of players back on the pitch and have the opportunity to counter-attack against them. That, as it goes on, will be interesting to see. Can they deal with that situation where they become so respected by other teams in the league that they have to break down the opposition and not concede as they did to Newcastle or not concede as they did to West Ham? They look better now. They look like a more organised unit. And, and, and certain players have emerged, like Aurier, I'd say, in, in particular on the right-hand side, 
spread. Left hand side looks better now with Regalon, although I think Davies is a very reliable defender. The centre half pairing seems to have sorted itself out, and the central holding pairing in midfield. These were all areas that weren't very clear in the first few games. I mean, Sanchez played a lot of matches early on. That was a partnership with, with Dyer and with Aldo Varela at various times. Uh, we've seen Roden coming in and do a very good job. Now suddenly it looks like he's got four for two, all of whom look competent, and he looks like he has four full backs that are competent for two positions. The midfield area might be less so, and Dembele is still a is still um, a bit of the team. He, he, you know, he, every game he play, starts, he has to go off after an hour or 65, 70 minutes. I don't think you can rely on him for sure. Lo Celso looks like he's a, he's a good option in that position. Heiberg and Suzuka have talked about good, good in stopping the opposition playing um, a disruptive, disruptive. Uh, um, obstacle I'd say for opposition but can they create when when it, when the other side of the game is necessary that remains to be seen the attacking part of the pitch we've spoken about and we know they've options not enough not much of um of bail yet but we may see him emerge as the season goes on what about Arsenal then 15th in the Premier League table they've lost five of the last seven I think it's one goal from open play in their last six matches Aubameyang had half a chance tonight, but he just looks a shadow of the player who was so brilliant and who carried them through so well over the last couple of seasons. What is the outlook for Arsenal and Mikel Arteta right now? Um, not, not very good. 13 points after 11 games is, is, is uh, quite dire from their point of view, I'd say. And, you know, all the early optimism that was there because they won the Cup last year in the Community Shield, which kind of came together fairly quickly given there was no great break in the season. There was a lot of optimism that he had sorted out some of the issues. Initially went to back three, not not today, but to, to solve some of their defensive frailties. And that looked like it, it was working. Then he changed. I think after the Aston Villa match, having beat Manchester United one nothing, which was the best win of the season, next match with this, more or less the same team, they were destroyed by Aston Villa 3 nothing. So then he goes to a back four and hopes that that will come along and work out for them. But it hasn't really. Um, they've got problems because obviously conceding a few goals, not concede, I think that's 14 they've conceded in the league, which is not drastic. But the problem is they're conceding them at, at vital times. And when the match, you look at the match today where they were open in the middle of the field, the stability you're hoping from for Partey, who a lot has been invested in him. I thought he did okay today, he did quite well up until he got the injury and walked off the pitch at the wrong time when Spurs were counter-attacking. Um, Arteta actually tried to push him back onto the pitch and I think he did further damage to the injury in trying to stop that Spurs attack. But, you know, it's, it's up front, the creation of chances, that's not happening. Depend on whipped in crosses from Bellerin and Tierney, not enough there. Obama Yang, his, his confidence seems to have operated. Lacazette is a bit in and out, not sure where he's going to start or not. Started today. I thought he did quite well playing that number 10 position, but unfortunately, the balance behind him of Zaka and Party didn't work out, and Sabayas come on, didn't make an awful lot of difference. So, not in great shape at the moment, Arsenal. Um, badly need to get a couple of victories. A couple of games coming up, which I think are not the hardest. Bournemouth, Everton, there's one other one there, I think, coming up soon that I'd say they, they should have a fair chance in. But right now, I'd say confidence has been drained. The manager is talking, great game but the team need, needs to start doing it on the pitch for the manager or else there's going to be you know, further turmoil between now and the end of the season. I don't see the manager being under pressure, but at least I think there's questions being asked. And I think you know, the idea of, well, we get the man, we have the man, we know the man. He's never managed before, but we know he's the right man. There's some questions about that now. Football on Off The Ball With Paddy Power New normal, same old football Paddy Power Gamble responsibly, gamblingcare.ie Follow the leader The Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV The world's best-selling plug-in hybrid Is now available with 0% finance And a free home charge point Worth 800 euro Leading the charge in plug-in hybrid technology, the Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV. Book a test drive at your local dealer today. Mitsubishi, drive your ambition. Terms and conditions apply. See Mitsubishi Motors.ie. Lending criteria applies. This is a hire purchase agreement provided by Bank of Ireland Finance. 
This Christmas, share the magic with a five-star Paris Court Hotel gift card. Surprise and delight with a range of luxury experiences. Paris Court Hotel Resort and Spa.